The interesting thing about us doing a call, and we had met a couple of years ago when you reached out on Twitter, but your dad's book and your dad have been in my life for certainly a decade plus. And so really have, it's had such a positive influence on me. And you know this because that's why you originally reached out. I've been a, I drink the Kool-Aid, right? <laughs> I think it's the most actionable thought leadership in business that, that exists. And I think the fact that your dad originally quantified it into the book so that anybody could really benefit from it affordably. And again, it's the thing that I love is just how actionable it is. But yeah, I know it's great to see you and your background is truly the best. Here is your dose of the ultimate sales machine coming to you from the new edition. Visit ultimatesalesmachine.com to get your copy or multiple copies. I am your host, Amanda Holmes, CEO of Chet Holmes International. What you're about to learn has assisted a quarter of a million businesses to generate billions of dollars working faster, better, smarter. Thank you. That means so much. And yeah. every time I've interacted with you, it's been so dynamic and you say these things and I'm like, ah, oh, man, I'd really like to know more. What is, I see you out with your family and it looks like you have a lovely vacations that you take. And I know that you're involved in so many different companies, but then you also have this love of interviewing people and media. So you do that as well. I feel like I know you better than I actually do because the amount of time I actually spent with you is very little. But I always think about you in my email signature too, because I remember the day I saw your email signature and went, holy heavens, I have to change my email signatures forever and always because of you. Thanks. Yeah. I've, you know what? And depending on which direction we take this call, I think I'm one of the most fortunate people you'll ever chat with. and. It's because number one, I'm an accidental entrepreneur. And two, I have ha had such outsized success in my business career that preceded my belief that I was ever going to be that successful. So I, I was fortunate to have built a company in my 20s that I sold mm. to a publicly traded company. And then it really set the stage for what I've done over the last 12 to you know, 14 years. Yeah, unpacking that certainly isn't going to happen in an hour, but I will tell you that the ultimate sales machine, Chet Holmes, and later Amanda Holmes have had a very, very strong impact on my career. Should I blow your mind now or should we wait a little bit? Do you want to be blown away I in the coach? I have just have been recording and I feel like that should be a part of it already. I know we were supposed to dialogue about what we talk about, but like the natural organicness of it. You just let me know because so I'm reading. So thank you so much for including a little blurb, a little testimonial from me in the newest edition of the ultimate yeah, citizenship because, because it. that's like a, that's like a kid's dream, his favorite book. And somehow he could read his name in there. But I had read the book prior to your update many times. Like it's probably, it's probably a book that I've read more times than any other book. But so I did read your most recent edition. But I got to the end, which you sent me a note saying, Chris, you should have read the final chapter first. Yeah. So I get to that final chapter. And there was something that you said there in there that touched me. So I took action and I'll show you real quick. So I'm one sec here. So I'm pulling this, I'm pulling this off my wall. Okay. And by the way, this is before you reached out and said, hey, let's do a podcast. Or no. Yeah, totally. Talk about serendipity and coincidence. But so don't live in wanting by Amanda Holmes. Whatever life throws my way, I'm so centered internally that my happiness isn't dictated by outside events. My intention is to be humble, grateful, and to serve others. So yeah, this is before you reached out a couple of like weeks ago or whatever. And that the, is why, I know. oh my God. Yeah, and it's not, yeah, it was just, it, I was moved by that and I couldn't agree with you more that your new chapter is the most important chapter in that book. 
And I was fortunate enough to have figured out a lot of that fairly early in my career. I've always been driven by purpose and trying to figure out how to make, how to balance like the spiritual side of me, which is a huge part. And I know it is for you as well. And then this high achiever gene, which I just can't shake. And it's, it creates so much disruption and dissonance in this guy that's had a koi pond for 20 years. Okay. And when people find, oh, you have a koi pond. Yeah. I have a koi pond because that's, that's my center. That's who I am. So anyway, that's coincidental that you actually just got to see that I had that. It's a little bit cheesy too, but yeah. So you're, I told you I was going to blow you away with it. You're like, that is amazing. Yes. I love that. Do you know that chapter? I wrote 94 versions of that thing. I, would I, I counted on my way to my a few keynotes ago. I it was like, I think it's a lot. So I'm just going to count all the Word documents. And that's not even counting all of the like Google documents where they kept getting updated. That's just Word documents alone. But how amazing of you to have included that because a lot of times with business and it, like even if you take this stuff to its extreme, right? It really does leave a lot to be wanted. Don't live in wanting. It, it, do, it really does. Like success is somewhat what I have found. And again, I've, I, was, I came from nothing. I was poor. And then all of a sudden I was super successful, had more money than I at that time than I, never would, I ever would have dreamed of. But then was like confused. Whoa, wait, how come I'm not getting as much sense of purpose and meaning as I'm getting from other things, like you referenced going on vacations and stuff from experiences and from just doing things that made me feel good and looking at the impact that you've now had on me. I just want to say thanks and just wanted to make the point that I think your willingness, your insistence, whether it took you 94 edits or not, of sticking, wedging, like literally like, get all this other stuff out of the way. I am putting my little spiritual, my little, my little flower <laughs> thing in. And you know what? It's my favorite chapter. But I also thought that a lot of the additional text that you added was, was really strong. It's a better book. Your dad would be so proud of you. Like it's just better. And you did mention in the book that, that you took some of his letters and some of his emails and stuff to really stay true. But again, and might disagree, would he have, and I'm using this just to make a point, but would he have forced a chapter in there on being centered and purpose-driven and all this other fun stuff, all this very important stuff that many business people, many people who've made so much money never figure out, but they never realize that that it's really a shallow kind of existence until you have a center and until you can live not in wanting, but in appreciation of what you have and your capacity to build stuff. Anyway, yeah. I, one, I wonder that for the first few years, I kept saying, if my father had lived through cancer, what would he have put into the new edition of the book? If he had survived, what would have happened because he changed so dramatically and one thing that I think you'll appreciate since you have a SEO company amidst all of yeah. your companies. So he started blogging when he got diagnosed and he was very public about his experience with his yeah. health, whether he wanted to go the alternative route or go the bone marrow transplant route. And he shared his whole battle with this. Today, I tried light therapy and it worked and here's my blood count. And can you please pray for me? I hope it goes down. This is what we're going for. And what was only supposed to be for our core family turned into, my father had like, it was something like 90,000 readers by the end of wow. two months. It was absurd. It just took off. But it was my father just shelling out his heart and soul on this blog every day about, this is what's going on with me. This is the doctor said I needed that I would die. So I told them to F off. And it was like, it was such a surreal experience and then everybody's all the comments that were made and people exchanging was got so intense that we had to shut down the blog because it 
everybody was like, you're going to die if you do this. It was like, I was only wow. sharing it for your prayer to yeah. assist. It was like Paring Bridge site. Yeah. Paring Bridge is usually oh, your yeah. Yeah. people. Yeah, it's not yeah. a big, but afterwards he was like, wow, the power of blogging. I had no idea. And that kind of spurred something in me to think if my father could amass all of this following in such a short period of time, just being honest and genuine about his strife and his battle. I think I should put that at the end of the book too. Smart. It's something I think men in particular have, and Brene Brown came to mind as I was listening to mm. you there because she writes a lot on vulnerability and this kind of thing. A lot of men struggle with that. I struggle with it for sure. I read it and I educate myself on it. And I'm like, yeah, need to be more vulnerable, need to be more human. So the fact that unfortunately that he was doing it in a caring bridge situation, because yeah. like, if that was public and et cetera, that if that was like a, I just also thought of Tuesdays with Maury by Mitch Album, like when he captures Maury's final days, there's so much wisdom, mm. in, but almost needs to be like shared, but, but cool. How did you enjoy the process of writing? Was this the first book that you authored outside of electronic stuff? Wasn't I supposed to interview you and now you're interviewing me, Mr. Interviewer, so good at interviewing. Okay. But is it your, was it your first book? Yes. It's my first day. I call it the encore that my father never got to give and how to live a rich and full life. But I feel that it is my father's final chapter, but my first chapter. So much more to come. You, yeah, I can't ask you questions. Go ahead. <laughs> You're right though. We should have done a call with her call, right? I know. I, so tell me a little bit about what's going on in your world. What, so that I have an idea of how I can steer this and help people get yeah. to where they. So, so the quick background is I was a professional student after high school and I had, I discovered this sort of high achiever gene when I was an undergrad. So I went to school at Penn State University. I'm a Pennsylvania native, and that's where I currently live and do business. Okay. I thought I was going to be a psychologist. I went to graduate school at Villanova University studying experimental psychology. Decided that the whole research part of it, while it was interesting, was I had a personality that needed to engage with people, and it was very like isolated, like conducting research. So then I went to law school without ever an intention of wanting to be an attorney. It was something that at that time I was interested in public service and government service. So I went to Albany Law School and again, the high achiever gene, and I'm not going to get into it because everybody, all the listeners would be like, man, that guy's really full of himself, but it wasn't like that. <laughs> I had nothing growing up. I just learned something that Tony Robbins imparted on me when I was a teenager, which is this idea that everything you need to take the first step towards wherever you want to go, whatever you want to do is within you right now. You don't have to wait. You don't have to wait. It just struck me when I was a teenager. So I went on this ridiculous high achiever thing. Then I had already alluded to this earlier, which is I'm an accidental entrepreneur because I went to law school, all this stuff. Like I'm not a business guy, but I'm a big thinker and I was a high achiever. And my brother called me while I was at Villanova and said, hey, Chris, what are your thoughts about selling Grandma Jones's, she called it Mississippi mud. What are your thoughts about selling that on the internet? And I was the guy that was pontificating about how this was going to change the world and stuff. So he called my bluff. He called me out. Didn't know much at all about what to do. And the interesting thing is I was in debt. I was poor. Of course, I had a bright future because of my education, but just wasn't clear like what I was going to do or who I was going to become. So I was like, yeah, let's do that. I'll build us a website. Didn't know how to do it. Self-educated. Then I'll figure out how to get us traffic. Started interviewing celebrity chefs because it was a gourmet food company. We changed the name from Mississippi Mud to Pepper Jam because it better described the product. Long story short, I self-educate. I stumble upon the early days of search engine optimization. The mm -hmm. early days of pay-per-click marketing. Back then, it was through a, a platform called GoTo.com, which later became Overture, was bought by Yahoo, yada. And I became an expert, like an early expert, right time, right place, good education, confident person. Wait, from law school, and after a short period of time, oh, by the way, this is crazy because I, I had nothing. 
So I learned how to generate traffic through SEO. And then I studied how to monetize this traffic. Mm. And by the time I was in my second year of law school, I was making over $100,000 a month profit. I literally was in New York State where I didn't have a bank account and I couldn't deposit checks. And I would get all these checks in the mail from all these affiliate networks. And I would have to drive over the border, which was a good hour and 15 minute drive to just deposit like $40,000 in checks and stuff. And at that time, I wasn't, I didn't have children. I wasn't married. I basically was just learning how to be an entrepreneur, even though that wasn't what I signed up to do. And fast forward, when I graduated from law school, I decided to take the couple million dollars that I had made in affiliate marketing and create a business, an internet marketing and later an affiliate network in my hometown called Pepper Jam. So we used, I used the gourmet food company. Then over the next like six, seven years, I built it into one of the larger digital marketing companies, one of the first of its kind. Gave me all these opportunities, Amanda, to do what you've been doing these last couple of years, keynotes, speaking, writing books, writing articles. And I was still super young. And it was just like, I was like unstoppable. And which leads me really to, so I sold Pepper Jam. We had about 130 employees, 2009. I sell it to then publicly traded GSI Commerce, which was a company that was owned by Michael Rubin. And for people who are listening, Michael Rubin was the part owner of the Sixers, the CEO of Fanatics. He's a really influential business person. Sold it to him. I had a five-year earnout and payout. About a year later, we got acquired by eBay. The oh. company was rebranded eBay Enterprise. My baby, my pepper jam was renamed that. And since I had, after that, I had started in an investment fund. And here's where I give you the dirt if you want to peel back the onion. But I was so fortunate. Here I am. Like, what do I want to do with my life? Let's bottle up what I've learned. Jesus, I'm, I just built a company and went through the whole process of mergers and acquisitions and made it out to the other side. I want to bottle this up and help others. I created an investment fund called KBJ Capital and in my hometown, and I just start making investments in businesses, mostly early stage tech. I've since made 40 some investments and that's what I've been doing mostly over these last 13 years, still writing, still publishing, still doing lots of public speaking. Many of the companies, which we could definitely peel back the onion on, in fact, mathematically, it's either six or seven, if you give me credit. I either founded or co-founded. Every mm -hmm. one of them have leveraged your book, The Ultimate Sales Machine. Every single one of them exceeded in revenue of over a million dollars within 18 months. So I founded or co-founded mm -hmm. six or seven companies, depending on if you give me credit, that have all generated a million dollars within 12 to 18 months, all using aspects of The Ultimate Sales Machine. And then in 2009, I had three offices and I was getting a little bit uptight about, I felt disconnected. I was like, I couldn't be in every spot at once. So I was like, I want to look for some real estate in my downtown and move these businesses into it. And again, I'm thinking social impact. I'm thinking there's a lot that I left out about how I've taken entrepreneurship and really focused on impact. But I bought a 35,000 square foot of real estate and created a technology accelerator called the Accelerator. My hometown, it's where I'm sitting right now. I'm sitting on the fifth floor of that building overlooking panoramic views of the Susquehanna River here. And I bought this property in 2019. And we have so many crazy stories, success stories of some of the businesses I own, but others, there's no requirement. You can come in, into the building and I'll provide you with support and advice and all this stuff. And it's become my new purpose and like where I've really been spending most of my time just trying to help companies in the building raise money, scale, hire, like all of those things. So wow. I, hopefully that wasn't 30 minutes. Hopefully that was only about four minutes, maybe six, but that gives you the lay of the land of mm -hmm. what I've been up to. Yeah. And like, like you through all of it, I still try to stay centered. I still try to 
make sure that, you know, what I'm doing and the way that I'm doing it is something that somebody could repeat and feel good about themselves. So, yeah, but I'm still looking out at the next five, 10, 15, 20 years. And I'm super excited about that too. So everything I just shared with you was like what led me up to this moment right now, where hopefully in the same way that you just wrote your first chapter of a book, I'm hoping that I still have a good decade to two decades left of impact. Wow. I love that. So do you actively look for those companies to come and be a part of your world or is it just natural word of mouth that they come to you? Most of it has been natural. My biggest success stories in this building were people who literally reached out, said, I'm moving in and that's it. Didn't even say, what is it? What's the, ec <laughs> the economics? And we have a bunch of those success stories, but yeah, the first eight or 10 years was a lot of me going out, speaking at tech conferences yeah. and attracting people who wanted to pitch me. And that was a lot of it. And I actually still do that. I'll still take pitches and I'll still listen to anybody that I could help. But now I'm really focused on this project. The building's about 80% full and the goal is to fill the building and build another one or buy another one. I just... It's a, it, entrepreneurship, and I think you've probably found this out or you're finding this out, is actually, I think it's a service profession. Yeah. If that's how you live it, if that's how you, you leverage it, it's a way of really making a difference, really helping people and, and really like feeling good about what you do and who you are. And so I'm less driven by the money and not that isn't an indicator, not that that isn't an important part of it. It's just that I'm fortunate enough to be able to figure out how the time that I spend has, it's, I have been saying for years now, ROT. Everybody's, what's the ROI? I'm like, what's the ROT? Return on time. And, yeah. and so that's why I've been more selective is where I'm going with this. And that's my building. And I warrant the best businesses possible in here. And I want to be able to give them as much of my time as possible to help them. But yeah, I still get pitched and I still, you referenced earlier that I do some media stuff and some, yeah, and some public speaking and stuff. I do those things too. I enjoy them. It's usually better when someone else is doing it with me. Yeah, I've worked with some influencers and some celebrities and candidly, I get a kick out of being able to rise to the occasion when you're getting interviewed alongside someone that is really why everybody's watching. And then there's I, one of my partners is a comedian and an actor, Damon Waynes Jr. And he's part of the Waynes family and they're super famous and they all look like one another. I could verify because I've seen them all in person. But yeah, he was on a bunch of TV shows like New Girl and stuff like that have become okay. yeah. by lots of people. And camera starts rolling and Damon's right next to me. He's a comedian. And I'm just like, man, you gotta really raise your game here. Cause everybody's mm -hmm. waiting for him to be funny. If there's an opportunity for me to maybe be funny as well, catches people by surprise. It's great. Anyway. It's great. So I understand that what fills your cup is impact. And that's what you're working on in your building, which I love. And out through those companies. It's fascinating. Yeah, and driven by a lot of my success, particularly at scaling things, have has come from the principles of the ultimate sales machine. Of mm. Your dad's work. It reminds me, I was, I forget the year, I should have probably looked before this call, but what year, if you don't mind me asking, did your dad pass? 2012. So I think it could have been 2012, might've been 2011. I'm in Las Vegas at Business Mastery by Tony Robbins. That morning, your dad was scheduled to speak that day. That morning, particularly me, was just shocked when we found out that he wasn't going to be able to make it and he was in the hospital and mm -hmm. this kind of thing. Again, the connection to your dad's life's work and the impact that it's had on the business side of me is profound. It's one of those things that, I mean, it's up there. Tony Robbins has had a huge impact on me too. 
A lot of it mostly is the personal development side, realizing that no matter who you are or where you are at or what has happened to you, you still have that personal gift, that personal power to build yourself up, to, to reset, to, again, like I said earlier, take action in the direction that you want to take your life. But all of that said, I also believe that building up institutional knowledge, so like expertise is one of the keys to becoming not only a thought leader, but like really successful at things. So with business, a lot of people are surprised sometimes when I'm on a panel or I get interviewed because I do tend to get a little bit less predictable. And I'll give you an example. I believe that business success comes as much from studying why businesses succeed and why they fail as it does from just having a great idea. Mm -hmm. And yeah. so your this book has been like such a treasure trove of actionable, specific knowledge mm. about how to effectively build and scale businesses, how to keep and capture attention, how to, again, ROT, it might be the most valuable book a business person can read to more efficiently use your time in an effective way. And every business, Amanda, and there's been so many of them over the years, every business I could share a story of how I've leveraged insights from this book. Yes, I do. I do want to hear this. Yeah. To help me grow, scale. We used to, there was a company that I had founded back in, call it 2012, 2013. It was a company mm -hmm. that was at the same time as Groupon. But what we did was we built a technology platform to do this for traditional media companies. So like newspapers, radio stations, TV stations, and we gave them basically a deal platform. So one of the things, one of the ways that we grew it was by creating conversations with the executives at these media companies. So I had two guys on my team. We we're all working in the same office. And it was Luke and Chris, yeah, another Chris. And we were competing to see who could be kind of more outrageous, a way where we wanted to win this competition, but to get the attention of top executives at these media companies. There was this one particular day, and at that time, he, this was the, like the publisher of the New York Times that we were trying to get in touch with. And all three of us were going to attempt to get in touch with this publisher. <laughs> I didn't win this contest, by the way. <laughs> by the, way, the other two individuals have read the book, were trained on the book, That's could talk great. about any aspect of the book. And it was Chris Nash, who at the time was the president of the company, who had, had said something or caught the attention of this, the publisher such that he had this, the call set up in the next 48 hours. And we just couldn't believe it. I was so angry at him. Mm -hmm. And I forget specifically what he did, but he basically was able to cut through the clutter and capture the attention of the publisher by a combination of a little bit of research and just some tactics, techniques that made that person feel like, wait, this is a little bit different. And in the same way that he, in book still talks about this idea of capturing attention by sending things that, yeah. that could end up on the person's desk. Chris had said something like, I, I called you three times yesterday and I forgot to leave a voice message, but <laughs> which he didn't do. Yeah, it's a, <laughs> yeah. Like a humble way of just trying to get someone's attention. But I wanted to let you know that I guess he found out that he was like a Yankees fan. Spring training starts and I'll be watching it next Tuesday. So I am available on Monday or Wednesday for a call. And sure enough, the guy writes back and Chris set the call up with them. And I'm just like, when you could get your team centered around best buyers, concentrating your energy around capturing attention, persistence, 
the seven to eight, nine follow-up rule. Like I, I've said to every single one of my sales teams, like guys and gals, you on the third, fourth touch outreach, don't expect some will respond, but at least seven times, eight times before you should start even like getting nervous. <laughs> uh, I have another quick story of one of the largest clients I ever closed it was a company called Common Bond. They had raised like one point some billion dollars in capital. It was the 33rd or 34th follow-up where the, at that time, the president of the company, Rob, who I still work with, he's left the company, but still work with them, followed up and he's, we're ready. Let's go. Let's do oh this. <laughs> and I was just like, totally looking back, I'm not wasn't really exhausting, exhausted, but it was exhausting to look at how many times I followed up over, literally over two and a half years. Wow. And won that client just through persistence. Most all of my best ultimate sales machine stories are really from persistence and just, just continuing knowing who you want to spend your time following up with, and then just following up and using all kinds of novel and creative ways to try to get them to respond and, or remember who you are. I've had lots of people say, uh, we just need to work with you because who wouldn't want to work with you? You just don't, you don't quit. And that, Never. Is all, oh. yeah, that was all learned from ultimate sales machine. I do. Can I tell you one funny story? Right? I think you'll appreciate those. So I met this Indian company. They're called Multila Oswal. They've served a million Indians and they have 600 sales reps who all have to read the book, not once, not twice, but three times That's during their intake process. And then they have to do a report and they have to present a chapter to the whole team to get approved that they've done this process of reading the book. It's just hysterical. That's crazy. And I know when I heard that, then I did a webinar for them, but nothing came of it for like doing extra work with them. And I thought, oh my gosh, I am going to be in India one day and I will present for this group because they're just avid fans. They even said, they told me, it rushes through our veins, Ultimate Sales Machine. It's in our blood. I'm like... Yes, I love these people. So I followed up using social for five years. And even during my Dream 100 boot camp, I showed them, here's what I'm doing to get multi-level also well. And I even had somebody in the audience say, you know, Amanda, that I would really give up. Like the way that person treated you, like it wasn't very kind. I'm like, of course it's not kind. You have to earn their respect. They don't care about you. And all of this is on video. And then fast forward in December, I went to India and I spoke in their sky. It's like a five story glass room. It's called the sky room or something. It was so epic to finally be there. And at the end of the keynote, so at the end, they're like, so when do you give up on a prospect? Like how many touches until you give up? And I laughed and I walked up to the middle of the stage and walked up to the top of the stage and I looked out and I went, guys. I have been following up for six years to stand here before you. Six years. Crazy. And, and everyone just starts clapping. Why am I not here with the guy in the front row, Multi Lull, who's the CEO of it, multi billionaire? Even he had to clap and go, that's impressive. Part of I, that was ma manifested. Part of it was just the true, the insight. Maybe the number one, top five for sure insights from your dad's is this idea of knowing who your targets are and making sure they're worth the time that you're willing to invest and then Huge. just following up without apology, but tactically and strategically for as long as it takes. How long? I remember one of my training sessions, because I've done so many training sessions with the book, I've done webinars, all this stuff. I remember one guy saying, how many times? I was like, as many times as it takes. <laughs> How many times? And it was just this moment where there's other people around. How many times does it take? And I'd yell back and he would yell louder. How many times it takes? It's funny. But some of it, though, in listening to you, there's a, and it goes into the spiritual stuff. I really do believe in law of attraction and manifestation and stuff. And I think for anybody listening, Tony Robbins talks a lot about this idea that start with your outcome because people are afraid to take that first step. And even when I was listening to you talk about 
this persistence with this Indian company and somebody saying to you, but they were got something back that, that would set most people off. I really think that that's par for the course of being super successful is being able to navigate that kind of feedback, but it's not justification for not taking the first step. It's not justification for the 30 second follow-up. I am telling you, Common Bond was closed on like number 34, two plus years later, major. So yeah, these are some of the things that are, you do need to pound into the process. Yes. You, you don't want to start second guessing yourself if you don't get a response in a short period of time. Make sure you're focused on the right customer or client that you're focused on but and change your approach if you need to but yeah don't stop that's then you won't have these great stories if you stop as <laughs> <laughs> the ones that we won on the first second third right place right time i had followed up with someone last uh, maybe two weeks ago it was just someone that came into my mind i was like yeah we work with this client in the past and i know my staff told me that it's a really complex company. They're really big, but they're really complex. I didn't let that bother me. And I just reached out to them and said, hey, let's open up conversations again. And the response was, oh my gosh, I can't believe you just reached out. We have to work with you starting yesterday. $10,000 a month for the next 12 months. Hmm. Already signed. It got signed within five days. Oh, and So just the mindset of building up your own confidence to say, I'm not going to judge myself based on these, for whatever the reason, the target, not responding. Timing is so much in business and often I'll get thanked for being persistent and doing it in a way where you have to have fun with it. You've got to be creative. You've got to be willing to try different approaches. I just recently connected with the CEO of a company who's raised $250 million. And honestly, I sent him a, a LinkedIn. I think that's still pending and I'd have to check, but I also sent him a, a tweet. Yeah. I'm connected on Twitter now and now sending each other emails. There's different ways of going about trying to establish some of that rapport and some of that early necessary Oh my gosh, I love the chapter on how you how you and your dad talk about like this progression of eventually having dinner at their house. Like mm -hmm. this idea of like where you're building relationships with someone. Oh, yes. Yeah, like you get to the point where you know the kids' names and then eventually you're going on vacation together. And I'll tell you that I don't know if it's I'm just a relationship person, but when I do these trips that you reference, I usually go to Costa Rica a few times a year and among other places. I don't know. I think I do business with these people because we're friends, but almost all of them are some of my largest clients. And we're like going on family vacations together. We're renting boats for the day. We're going out sport fishing and they feel so taken care of as it relates to the business side, through that relationship building. So for some people, it might be like, oh, it's impersonal. But if you could get to the point where your best clients are people that you would go out for dinner with or go on vacation with and just mm -hmm. have that level of trust, it's crazy. And again, I look back on my career and I say, wow, I could appreciate this stuff. But part of the reason I was doing it was because of my belief in what I learned some 15 years ago when I read the book for the first time, you know? I love that. Yeah, it was shocking for me coming into business and nobody would invite me to dinner with their kids. And I was like, I was upset. I thought that was so rude of them because I thought that's how business went. But no, it was just how my father did business. I went to right. so many of the client meetings because that's just how he was. Always, so many people tell me, oh, I saw so many pictures of you growing up. I knew you were a singer. Yeah, because my father would show my picture to everyone. And that was just another piece of him just building rapport. It was all about relationships. I love that. I love you know, that, that you go on vacations. That's another one too. I go on vacations. Most vacations I take are with, with clients. It's funny. My, my wife 
jokes. We'll be at, we'll be at a nice steakhouse or whatever in Costa Rica. And like most recently, two families went with us. Both of them were clients, just coincidental or whatever. <laughs> and I am totally like fighting because I want to pay this bill. And by the way, I paid that bill with personal funds, but just the funniness was my wife saying, because all our kids are there, their kids are there. I think there were like 16 or 17 of us, to be honest with you. Oh, wow. And I grabbed for the bill. They grabbed for the bill. And then my wife joked, ah, it's a business expense. And I was just like, certainly could, you know, certainly justify it. But when you get to that point, you know, where you're able to be in that position, relationships are certainly more important than the business. And if it could get to that point where you're still serving them and you're giving the customer, the client, whatever your attention, I developed this thing. I don't know if it's, I say it. And when I say it, I'm like, I'm not sure how many people would do this. I know my staff, I've never asked them their opinion on it, but here's what I do. Because a lot of our clients are friends, my personal friends. I will say to anybody who I'm friends with that wants to do business with me, I said, listen, I have a team. They're going to do most of the work. I said, but you will always have a back channel with me. And so I refer to it as a back channel. I give every single one of my clients at LSEO that I become friends with, and the hope is that I become friends with all of them, this back channel. And what that means is, and it's only been used a few times, I can't ever remember being fired or anything like that, but they'll be like, hey, I'll just use someone's name, Amanda, making mm -hmm. that up. She isn't, she comes a little bit late to her, to, to the weekly standups, or I didn't get our report last month. And then I'll be like, Frank, really appreciate it. We'll take care of that. And we'll fix it. And I'm sure enough, I go to Amanda and I fix it. So it's this interesting dynamic that I have with some of these clients where, you know, as the founder of the company, they just feel special that they have a back channel such that if they ever need to give really straight advice or whatever or feedback, which I've gotten sometimes, I've gotten some back channel on how to handle a departing employee, just as an example. This one of our clients reached out and said, Hey, I just want to give you some advice. I said, Go for it. And they said, You could have done it this way. I was like, Wow, that's the fact that we have that. And this is a client that's been with us for five or six years. Wow. You know, anyway, it's all magical. When you could get to the point where it's not just transactional, but you're really truly trying to serve people, you are, you're willing to be unapologetic about how persistent you are in the pursuit of success or in the pursuit of following up. It's just all so cool, which is part of the reason like I'm talking so much, but it's really because I just, I truly sincerely from the bottom of my heart believe that what you were able to take over on behalf of Chet Holmes, your top is just such a profound opportunity, not only for those of us that have consumed it, but for you as well and your team to be able to continue on. I was saying, and I was in like a executive meeting before this, and I just said a little bit, I was just like, she wasn't a business woman. And I do remember your dad talking about you when like, when I would see him speak and stuff. And she wasn't a businesswoman. The first couple of years were hard. She has this like spiritual side, like the whole my or the whole Florida thing that you shared in the book and stuff. And look at now she is just rushing it. And you've got your spiritual side, that little that aura, that center, that koi pond, that whatever it is, <laughs> which I've kind of struggled with. When I public speak, sometimes I will. I'll, I will go off tangent just because I want to inspire. I want to encourage people to balance success with the not point of life. Thing. Yeah. This, and, oh, but, I'll have to send you. I just did a, a talk for a bunch of billionaire investors on a Saturday and I talked about mortality and I talked about death on stage. It was <laughs> totally bizarre. But everyone loved it. And then I pulled out my guitar and then I played and I made everyone sing with me. I made, I got buy-in, but it was freaking great. And there should be, and then I showed them Dream 100 and how they could double their sales in the next 12 months and the messaging, but all of that. So smart and right? so brilliant, so cool, so fortunate.
that you're, Why not? you're able to merge your all those different things together. Cool. That's, yeah. that's the and, fun part. And so hopefully for both of us, we're, we're still in the early stages of what is going to be so much excitement over these coming years to just make a difference and to build things, scale things, which is just fun. If you, if you talk about mortality in theory, if you don't grow, you pass, you die. And so progress in many ways equals happiness. As long as the progress you're making is purposeful for you and that you appreciate it and you're grateful for it. In these coming years, anything that I could do to be supportive of you and anybody in your universe, on the one hand, that's just my nature, but I almost feel like I, I benefited so much that, that moment. So just so the folks that are listening, so probably about call it three or four years ago, I wrote, I contributed an article to Inc. Magazine where I just authentically talked about my favorite books, the books that have had the biggest impact on me. And sure enough, number one was The Ultimate Sales Machine. And sure enough, Chet Holmes' daughter, Amanda Holmes, reads this and she's with this guy. And again, this has to be, let's see, 2019. This might be five years ago now. Yeah. At least. Because it was I was in my former offices and this kind of thing. And so you send me a DM on Twitter and you're just like, hey, Mr. Jones. Hey, Chris. Thank you so much. And we went back and forth and talk about manifestation and just right place, right time. We continued to like chat and blurbs. And some at one point you said, hey, we're going to be working on a new edition of the book. And maybe we could take some of the stuff you said in your ink article and maybe put it into the book, into the a testimony or whatever. And the interesting thing is that wasn't the first time I've ever had, I probably had it 10 times where other authors will do this. But yeah. number one, there was no certainty that you were ever going to get to the point where you did get that edition out. But of course you are who you are. So of course you did. <laughs> and then number two, I wanted to make sure that, and again, not through any like effortful way, but I just wanted to, that is cool. And then eventually you did it. And then I bought the book, a bunch of copies of the book, not knowing if it was even in there. And then I opened, oh, up, that. <laughs> I opened up the book and there it is. And it's, it's just, it's one of those things where for those that are folks that are listening, it's don't think that anything is too big to ever happen. You almost have to believe, first off, you have to believe in yourself, bar none. That's just the most important thing in your capacity to do just about anything and to experience just about anything. Don't make it all about money. Make it about purpose and impact and these kind of things. But it's crazy that once you believe in yourself, the serendipity and the coincidences that could happen. Like it's really a small world when it comes down to where you could find yourself unexpectedly. When I would put that moment where you reached out as I've done some amazing things. I keynoted in front of 15,000 people. I've been on television, reality TV. I set a goal when I was a teenager who was poor single mom that I was going to be a millionaire by the time I was 30. That happened when I was like 22 or 23. But it's like all of these things. But that moment where it's just because I have been one of the best evangelists, best supporters for all the right reasons. Nobody ever asked me to but it's because of the life's work of your dad and now your life's mission and work. That is just so amazing. And you get it all the time because of just how great this content is, but you keep doing your thing too, because you're going to be able to do a legacy and you already are, but do it in your own way and do it in a way that just has great impacts. It's just, it's just so cool, Amanda. And the thing is, I can't wait to like watch over these coming years. I hope you continue to play around with the music and yeah. do some crazy things from the stage. I hope to be, be at some of those things and any way that I could support you in game. So yeah. it's a real honor to be able to build a relationship, a friendship, and to associate myself with you. Wish you nothing but the best. Thank you. And no, I'm not going to go grab the guitar and start playing. <laughs> I'm close. Maybe we should bring the, the don't live in wanting again. That's just so cool. I just, <laughs> knew, wild. I just knew. I was just like, who, like, how is it even possible that I had done that before you had reached out? So uh, it is wild, wild. So uh, for those that want to find you online, where would they go look? 
Yeah, to complete that thought real quick, because I know we're at we're towards an end here. So what I do on a day-to-day basis is I'm in the accelerator at Wolksbear. And I think it's acceleratorwb.com for people, business people out there that might be open to relocating. Tons of benefits to coming into the building. We have something called the Keystone Innovation Zone, which if you're qualified, you could get up to $100,000 tax credit every year. These are things that Pennsylvania has put in place to try to attract businesses here. First, first year of rent could be free. Um, it's another program called the Spark Program, a partnership with us and the mayor of our town. So anyway, Accelerator wilkes I'm super transparent, like in social media. So LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram. And that's Christopher Jones with a K. Yes. My name is Christopher with a K. My, uh, my handles are like KBJ Capital. That's my investment fund. And yeah, that, that's it. My digital marketing company that was referenced a few times, which has really benefited, has generated tens upon tens of millions of dollars because of the ultimate sales machine and have, and has acquired clients that include ESPN, PayPal, ring doorbell. Like it's unbelievable what we've been able to do together, Amanda, (laughs) 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 over a long period of time. But LSEO is a three-time finalist, the best SEO agency in the United States. People look at me as particularly if you've raised capital because I've raised tens of millions in venture and I know that side and as a professional investor. So anybody that's listening that, that has raised money or works for a company that's raised money, I could help you think through the best way to, to use those proceeds to, to grow and scale the business. That's lseo.com. And that's it. Wow. Yeah. So many places to find him. Go find him. He's magnificent, obviously. We were Thank meant, you. by the way, to, to, to have had this, this recording. You were meant to have reached out five, six years ago, which is hilarious that you reached <laughs> out to me. I didn't reach out to you because if I did, it would have been, I would have pursued you, but I didn't have <laughs> that, manifested it. But, but it's super cool. And I think for those people that are listening or watching or whatever it becomes, take a couple of the anecdotes that we both shared here and just believe in yourself and swing the bat. And if you miss, okay, just keep swinging again. There are, there are not three strikes in the ultimate sales machine. <laughs> that's, a good one. that's a good one. Definitely way more than three. Yeah, that might Thanks. be the end right there. There are more than there three you strikes. Go. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. And that is another episode of your weekly dose of the ultimate sales machine. Thank was, you. Yeah. That was fantastic. Are you kidding me? Yeah. You well, I, it's also true when you're when you're your authentic self. It's like even doing TV interviews and it just doesn't matter. It's if you could get closer to who you ultimately want to be. And I see that so much in you. And I'm so like, and that part of you that that seems to be destined to always be centered and to be pure in what you're doing is so cool because we just don't see it that much in, in the corporate world, in the business world. I love that part of you. And so I'm glad that you reached out and that I showed a side of myself as well that, that has commonality with you in that pursuit of balance and that pursuit of gratitude instead of accumulation comes when you stop focusing on scarcity. So many people live their life around protecting stuff when we're a fear. And once you become closer to yourself, the crazy things that can happen are just so cool. If you're enjoying the weekly dose of the ultimate sales machine, then you'll love our new community program, the ultimate sales machine dojo. Because business is more complex, more crowded, more difficult than ever before. 90% of executives believe that we're about to hit a recession. So we have to truly avoid the shiny object syndrome. We can't just wing it in our marketing and sales processes anymore. We have to get hyper-focused and do what works during a no-spend economy. So what would be more enjoyable than spending just one hour a week with a group of pig-headed, disciplined, and determined companies that are committed to grow? Because in studies of previous recessions, 91% of companies either go stagnant, decrease, or go bankrupt during recessions versus 
9% that actually grow. If you want to be part of that 9%, that's why we've created the dojo. Visit dojo, D-O-J-O dot ultimate sales machine dot com. That's dojo, D-O-J-O dot ultimate sales machine dot com to apply. In just one hour a week, you can transform your whole business, taking just a handful of concepts and working to master them with repetition, right? Just like my father taught, like the Dream 100 or the Best Buyer Strategy, education-based marketing, time management secrets of billionaires. We dissect the concepts, bring it back for discussion and workshop the solutions and how to implement it into your company's DNA. This is for CEOs, marketing and sales departments. We want everyone to be on the same page. And not only that, we're inviting professionals that want to use brain power over wallet power, solving old problems with new ideas. If you want to simplify and make bigger bets on fewer things, if you want to be surrounded by that group, all you have to do is apply for the dojo at dojo.ultimatesalesmachine.com. I'd love to see you there. I'm extending my sacred space to a group of like-minded individuals that all want to elevate during a time when everyone else is in panic. We're not. We're just hyper-focused. We've got a roadmap ahead of us that's worked for 250,000 businesses that's generated over $2 billion for our clients. We know it works. We just have to have the pig-headed discipline and determination to do, so why not do that in a community? I look forward to seeing you there, if you're willing and able to do something great. Visit dojo.ultimatesalesmachine.com to apply.